This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. Go to the link in the description below so they know that I sent you. Hello everyone, I'm Nitsahon, and it is that time again here on my channel, Limited Review Week. All of War of the Spark has now been revealed, and that means that I will be very busy over the next week, putting out a new video every day about the limited format. First up, I give my initial impressions about every card in the set, going color by color, and today we're starting with white. I use a letter grade system to convey how good I think the cards will be, and I also talk a fair amount about each of them, but if you want to know more about my grading system, I made a whole video for that purpose. You should be able to find it in the description below. Also, keep in mind that these are my assessments of the cards before actually having played the format, and there is no way I'm going to be 100% correct with my impressions here. And with this set, well, as unique as it is, with 20 uncommon planeswalkers, it will be even harder than usual to judge things. Also keep in mind I'm talking about limited formats. I'm just talking about draft and sealed for these cards. I'm not talking about any other formats you might be interested in. All right, with all that out of the way, let's take a look at our first card in the War of the Sparks set review. And that card is a Johnny's Pride Mate, which for one generic and a white is a 2-2 cat soldier at uncommon. And whenever you gain life, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it. The Pride Mate's back. It's good every time we've seen it. A two mana 2-2 two -two as a fail case makes it so that it has a very reasonable floor. You do need some life gain in your deck to get it going, but I would guess most white decks in this format probably will end up with two to three cards that can gain them life without even trying. And if that's the case, then the Pride Mate is at least a C in your typical white deck in the format, but it has an impressive ceiling and can definitely take games over if you get a bunch of cards with life gain. It also benefits from the fact that Proliferate is in this format, meaning you don't need to gain life more than once, as long as you can also proliferate. So I think it has a ceiling of at least a B. It may even be a B plus. And I think in some weak packs, first picking a Johnny's Pride Mate is probably worth doing because it has such a reasonable floor and such a high ceiling, and it's not that hard to build around. As we look through all the white cards and just the white cards today, we're going to see lots of proliferate and several ways to gain life. All right, so let's move to our next card, which is Battlefield Promotion, which for one generic and a white is a common instant. And it says, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. That creature gains first strike until end of turn, and you gain two life. So there's a way to gain life. But this is a decent combat trick that has obvious synergy with plus one, plus one counter stuff. A stats boost and first strike is enough to win a significant number of combats, and gaining two life is some nice icing on the solid combat trick cake. It is still a combat trick with all the inherent risks that come with them. They're situational and you can get blown out by a two for one, but I think you'll play one or two of these in aggressive white decks, and I think that means it's a C. Next, we have Bond of Discipline, which for four generic and a white is an uncommon sorcery, and it says tap all creatures your opponents control. Creatures you control gain lifelink until end of turn. This is the kind of card that's really going to make you groan when you see it, when your opponent casts it, the kind of card that's just going to end games. It might be kind of clunky at five mana, and it isn't always going to be good, but I can't see being a white deck and not feeling like one of these would be decent in my deck. Getting all blockers out of the way and hitting your opponent with everything while you gain life, if it doesn't kill them, will make the gap between your life totals massive and make it very hard for your opponent to race you. Like I said, though, it isn't something you really want more than one of most of the time because there are times when it just doesn't do anything or not enough. But as a one of, I think I basically always want one in my white deck, and I think that means it's a C+. You don't want to take it super early, but I think you're happy to get one anytime you can. Next up, we have Bulwark Giant, which for five generic and a white is a 3-6 giant soldier at common, and when it enters the battlefield, you gain five life. This is the kind of card that can really stabilize you against an aggressive deck. Five life is huge against decks intent on ending the game quickly, and a 3-6 is no small roadblock. Obviously, this is primarily a defensive card, and any card like that isn't something every deck is going to want, especially in white. Because of that, I don't think I can go much higher than just saying this is a solid C, and playing one of these is fine, but you probably cut it a significant portion of the time as well. Next up, we have Charmed Stray, which for one white mana is a 1-1 one, one cat at common. It's got lifelink, and when it enters the battlefield, you put a plus one plus one counter on each other creature you control named Charmed Stray. So a one mana 1-1 one, one with lifelink is not a good card. It's probably a D minus, and that's sort of what this is at a base level. One mana 1-1s one, just aren't very good in limited. They are only relevant very briefly, unless they have some useful keyword or activated abilities, and lifelink doesn't qualify as relevant here. 
Obviously, the idea here is to have multiple copies of this card and then it improves. And I mean, yeah, it does improve, but I feel like even if you have four of these, the chance that you're able to drop this when the other is in play isn't great. It is a nice place to put plus one, plus one counters or auras because of lifelink, but there are way nicer options out there. Plus, now that I think about it, there aren't really any auras in this set. I'm going to say this is a D minus with one copy and maybe a D plus with four. Maybe it gets up to the lower C range if you've got five. Overall, I have a hard time being interested in this. It makes you have to draft a bunch of copies of it, which isn't necessarily going to be easy to do. And even when you do, the payoff doesn't seem worth it to me. Overall, I plan on picking them up super late in packs and maybe hoping I get other copies of it and maybe it'll work out. But most of the time, it just isn't going to happen. So I advise against playing it in most situations, though it is passable if you're desperate for a creature or life gain because you have a Johnny's Pride Mate, like four of them or something. Next, we have Defiant Strike, which for one white mana is a common instant, and it says target creature gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. Draw a card. Last time we saw this, it was surprisingly good because it was in cons of Tarkir, and the prowess mechanic was all over the place, including on white cards. Not the case here, though. Plus one, plus zero is the kind of stat boost that will have very little impact on combat the majority of the time, and normally, you want your combat tricks to make it more likely your creature wins combat against larger creatures. And sure, this does cycle itself, and that's what keeps it from being unplayable, but it still isn't very good. I don't plan on playing this unless I'm desperate. I'm giving it a D. Next up, we have Divine Arrow, which for one generic and a white is a common instant, and it says Divine Arrow deals 4 damage to target attacking or blocking creature. These types of situational removal spells are always pretty nice. That's because the situation they ask for... That a creature with toughness 4 or less is either attacking or blocking is the kind of thing that just happens across the course of a game. This can kill a substantial number of creatures and trade down for them considerably, much like Gideon's Reproach, which I think this is a functional reprint of. In the end, I think the efficiency this has, along with the fact that it isn't actually that situational, makes it so that this is in the lower range of first pickable and a really good common. I'm giving it a B-. Next up we have Enforcer Griffin, which for 4 generic into white is a 3-4 griffin at common, and it's got flying. We have seen creatures like this in the past. A dinosaur version of it appeared in Ixalan, and last time we saw that card, it sort of overperformed, at least to me. I didn't expect a 5-mana 3-4 to be a solid playable. I probably gave it a C- in my set review, but in the end I think it ended up being at least a C, and I think that's what we have here. Those stats are pretty good. It can block lots of sort of mid-rangey flying creatures. It can attack through a lot of the reach creatures in the format. You know, it's solid, it's nothing special, but you could do worse in your 5-drop slot, and I think that means it's a C. Next up, we have Finale of Glory, which for X and 2 white is a mythic rare sorcery, and it says create X 2-2 two, two white soldier creature tokens with vigilance. If X is 10 or more, also create X 4-4 four, four white angel creature tokens with flying and vigilance. So this is part of a cycle that overall is super powerful. That's not the first time I'm going to say that in this video, but I am saying it now. And this one seems really good. Four mana, let's say you spend four mana on this to make two 2-2 two, two white soldier creature tokens with vigilance is the kind of card we see as a solid common like a C-plus in limited formats. Obviously making just one token doesn't feel too good, but two and up, you're getting an okay deal, and then it just starts to get silly. Then, if you play it stupid late and you pay 10 for X, you're just going to win the game because your board gets absurd. I do think when looking at these finales, you have to think about exactly how much mana you need to spend to feel like you're getting a good deal, and then consider how likely getting that much mana is. Like I said, here, I feel at 2, you feel fine, and 3 and up, you start to feel really good, and at some point, it really just shifts into being a bomb, and that's probably somewhere around... Uh, six mana total spending on it. And I think I'm going to give this an A-. minus. I think you first pick it. I, th I think it's just going to win a lot of games in this format. And it's also aided by the fact that there are bonuses for going wide, especially in green-white. So keep that in mind as well. Next up, we have our first Planeswalker in this set, which is Gideon Blackblade. For one generic and two white, it's a legendary Planeswalker Gideon at Mythic Rare, and he's got four loyalty. And he has a static ability. All Planeswalkers in this set have those. That's one of the new things we're looking at here, is that all Planeswalkers in this set have static abilities. And that's one thing that's going to make us have to evaluate them a little differently, because it's almost like they're enchantments, although Gideon's not the best example of it, uh, in addition to being uh, Planeswalkers. So Gideon Blackblade's static ability says, as long as it's your turn, he's a 4-4 human soldier creature with indestructible that's still a Planeswalker, 
and prevent all damage that would be dealt to him during your turn. He has a plus one loyalty ability that says up to one other target creature you control gains your choice of vigilance, lifelink, or indestructible until end of turn. And he has a minus six that says exile target non-land permanent. So this is silly. Good luck beating this if your opponent plays it on turn three. He's effectively a three mana four four with indestructible who can take his loyalty up by granting another creature a pretty powerful keyword ability. And then eventually he can do his minus six to kill anything. So basically, as he is beating you to death, he's also getting closer to killing any awesome creature you might play that may otherwise save you. So I say it again, good luck beating this Planeswalker on turn three in Limited. In addition to being absurd early, he's still pretty great in the later part of the game since he can enhance creatures and complicate board states, not to mention function as removal or a win condition if he sticks around long enough. He's just an A+. Plus. He's one of the best cards in this set. However, you'll see he's not the only A+, plus in this set, which is pretty silly. In general, this set's power level is higher than really any that I've looked at before in my set reviews. So there are more A+, pluses than usual, and more A's in general. Next, we have Gideon's Sacrifice, which for one white mana is a common instant, and it says choose a creature or planeswalker you control. All damage that would be dealt this turn to you and permanence you control is dealt to that chosen permanent instead if it's still on the battlefield. I know this card's important lore-wise, but it is pretty bad limited-wise. Effects like this can, of course, be pretty great, but you have to consider how frequently it is that things align in such a way that this works out. It is insanely situational, and you know how I feel about fog effects, and that's kind of what this is. They aren't worth a card because they don't impact the board. You'd rather just draw like a two drop in most situations when you draw a fog. This is basically a fog that makes you kill one of your creatures. And sure, it is a little more flexible than fog because it can redirect any damage, not just combat damage, but I'm still not sold on this. A lot of the times you'll just be two for one yourself, or worse, two for nunning yourself, and I think that makes this an F. Next up, we have Gideon's Triumph, which for one generic and a white is an uncommon instant, and it says, target opponent sacrifices a creature that attacked or blocked this turn. If you control a Gideon Planeswalker, that player sacrifices two of those creatures instead. This is situational, but I think it is efficient enough that it doesn't matter. Keep in mind, by the way, that you can wait to use this until after combat is over. Like if your opponent double blocks and you can kill only one of their creatures in combat, if you use this after that one creature dies, you can also get the second creature during your second main phase, assuming it is their only creature that blocked. It also works if your opponent's the one attacking you and you block and kill one of them, and then in the second main phase you can use Gideon's Triumph. So while it is situational, you can make it a little more targeted than it feels like you can. And frequently, you know, what your opponent's going to be attacking you with is like a big evasive creature. And when that's the case, obviously it's going to be really, really good because you'll be trading up and using only two mana to kill their, you know, five or six mana card. I think overall this is first pickable in weaker packs and a B-. minus. Next up, we have God Eternal Oketra, which for three generic and two white is a 3-6 legendary zombie god at Mythic Rare. She has double strike, and whenever you cast a creature spell, she makes a 4-4 black zombie warrior creature token with vigilance. When she dies or is put into exile from the battlefield, you may put her on top of your library, third from the top. So she's also part of a cycle of gods that all do that last thing the same way that is getting put on top of your library three cards deep. And she's also part of an absurd cycle. A 6-mana 3-6 with double strike is probably already like a B, then Oketra just turns out 4-4 zombies every time you play a creature spell, which, by the way, the typical limited deck usually has at least 15 of, so this isn't really a build-around. And then, of course, there is the God Clause for this cycle, and that means even if your opponent kills it, she's coming back in a few turns. This is great, and first pickable over almost everything in the set. I think she's also an A+, which, if you're keeping score, is the second A+, just in this color. And normally, I don't hand out A-pluses at all, or maybe one in one whole set review, so we're already at two of them in the first video, and we're, what, halfway through it, maybe? Maybe not even that. So, yeah, this set is strong. Now, let's move to the next card, which is Grateful Apparition which for one generic and a white is a 1-1 uncommon spirit with flying, and when it deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker, you proliferate. 
This is a returning mechanic, and I'll read it to you because it's the first time we're seeing it in this video. Choose any number of permanents and or players, then give each another counter of each kind already there. It is worded kind of weird, but basically, you can choose to make everything that has a counter on it gain another counter when you proliferate, and for this, that's when you do combat damage. While proliferating is nice, and this set has lots of plus one plus one counters and loyalty counters on Planeswalkers, I think this card gets held down in the sky a little bit too easily. Lots of other creatures with flying are in this set, some with reach are as well, and it's small, so it gets pretty much stonewalled the moment your opponent has something that's of decent size. That said, I guess if you want to be proliferating, you probably have plus one plus one counter synergies going on, so maybe you're putting counters on the apparition for it to get through, and then it makes itself bigger. I don't know. I see this as fine, but not very exciting in most cases. I'm just giving it a C. Next up is Ignite the Beacon, which for four generic into white is a rare instant that says search your library for up to two Planeswalker cards. Reveal them, put them into your hand, then shuffle your library. I think that most decks in this format won't want this, because you probably need like four Planeswalkers for it to be useful, and while that's more possible in this set than in any before, I think on average you're going to get like two to three. Four might be a little on the high end. Five mana to draw two cards is steep. But at least the two that you get are Planeswalkers, but at the same time, temper your expectations because Planeswalkers in this set don't pack the usual punch they do, at least on average. I think this is a playable card if you have four or more Planeswalkers, but I don't think it's really ever anything special. I mean, maybe it kind of gets there if you have something like Gideon Blackblade, but overall, I think this is an F in your typical deck in the format and probably just has a ceiling of like a C. So it's nothing special. Definitely don't go after it early. If you look at your deck and you're like, hey, I have a bunch of Planeswalkers, you can probably play it, but it's not going to be anything exciting. Next up, we have Ironclad Crovod, which for three generic and a white is a 2-5 beast at common, just a vanilla guy. Mediocre defensive creature, if you're in the market for one, that's what this gives you. But most of the time, I don't think you're really in the market for that. And that means I'm giving it a D. Next up, we have Law Rune Enforcer, which for one white mana is a 1-2 human soldier at common. And you can pay one generic and tap it, and then tap target creature with converted mana cost 2 or greater. This is an insane common. Anytime we've seen Master Decoy around, it has been great. And in some ways, this is better than Master Decoy. For one thing, it is one fewer mana to cast for the same stats, and it only asks for colorless mana to tap things. Of course, the original Master Decoy can tap any creature, but tapping things with converted mana cost 2 or greater is what you do with this kind of card 99% of the time anyway, so it isn't a huge downgrade. Being able to lock down your opponent's best creature or get a problem blocker out of the way is huge, and in a lot of ways, a card like Law Rune Enforcer becomes a one-mana removal spell that can just deal with whatever your opponent's best card is and scale as the game goes on. If they play something scarier, it can still tap that too, you know, unless it turns out to be a token or something, and that wouldn't be so good. But this is absolutely an excellent common, and I think one you're happy to first pick. I think you'll play like six copies of these if you get them. I'm giving it a B. Next up, we have Loxodon Sergeant, which for three generic and a white is a 3-3 elephant soldier at common with vigilance. And when it enters the battlefield, it gives all your other creatures vigilance until end of turn. So a four mana 3-3 with vigilance is probably like a C minus. Those stats aren't that good. And vigilance, while upgrading the card, doesn't do a ton to help you feel good about playing it. Obviously, vigilance for your whole team when this comes down is nice. Oftentimes that means you can make an attack that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise because you're in a race and you have to leave back blockers. And this lets you do that and attack. But I don't love this card overall. Uh, I feel like I'm not going to feel bad about having this in my deck, but I probably don't want more than one. So I think that makes it a C. Next up we have Makeshift Battalion, which for two generic and a white is a human soldier at common. And whenever it and at least two other creatures attack, you put a plus one plus one counter on it. So it has the actual battalion mechanic without saying it. So a three mana three two these days is like a D in most formats. You'll play it if you're an aggro deck and you don't have enough three drops, but you mostly hope you don't end up playing it. This comes with additional upside with that battalion mechanic, which is clever given its name, but the upside there isn't that huge. It just won't always be easy to send in two additional creatures with it, and it won't be worth risking trade so much either since the payoff is just a plus one plus one counter. It's not a bad card, it's just not something you should be that excited about. I think it's solid, I think it's filler, and it's an upgrade over the usual two generic and a white 3-2 we seem to have seen a lot of lately, and I think it's a solid C. 
Next up, we have Martyr for the Cause, which for one generic into white is a 2-2 human soldier at common, and whenever it dies, you proliferate. These days, another sort of mediocre vanilla creature we see a lot is a 2-mana two 2-2. Two. It's nothing special. It's the kind of thing you'll play in your aggro deck if you're desperate for 2-drops, making it like a D-plus on its own. This guy adds proliferate, which means that he has some late-game relevance. Even if he can just block and add a couple counters to your permanence, that's going to be pretty nice. This makes him a solid 2-drop option for white decks. I'm giving him a C, and he might move closer to a C-plus in decks that really get there on plus 1, plus 1 counters. Next up, we have Parhelion 2, which for 6 generic and 2 white is a 5-5 legendary artifact vehicle at rare. It has flying, first strike, and vigilance, and when it attacks, you create 2 4-4 four, four white angel creature tokens with flying and vigilance that are attacking, and it has crew... Four. If you're not familiar with vehicles, that means you have to tap creatures with power equal to or greater than what the crew cost is, which is four here, and then this turns into a creature. Otherwise, it's not a creature. It's just an artifact on your board that doesn't interact in, with creatures in combat in any way. So eight mana is a ton in limited, and the vast majority of games are over before either player has eight mana in most formats. As a result, as cool as this card is, and as powerful as it is if it ever comes into play... You just want to always be able to make that happen, and it will get stuck in your hand more frequently than it's going to come into play. That said, 13 damage in the air is a nightmare for your opponent, and it is kind of cool that the Angels have Vigilance, so you can still crew to block during your opponent's turn if you need to. Still, 8 mana and crew 4 means there will be times when you can play this, and you still can't crew it. I don't think you should first pick this. I think you should pick it up mid to late pack if it looks like you're a control deck, or if you have a lot of ramp. But most of the time, I just don't think you can play this because of its prohibitive mana cost. I'm giving it a D+. Next up, we have Pouncing Lynx, which for one generic and a white is a 2-1 cat at common, and as long as it's your turn, it has first strike. Two mana, two one, first strikers are always nice little cards for aggressive decks in limited formats. And sure, this only has it when it's attacking, but that's still great. This is a difficult creature to deal with in the early game, and first strike can even pose problems later in the game for your opponent. This can be especially good in conjunction with plus one, plus one counters or combat tricks. This has a good chance to be the best common two drop for white decks in this format. I think that's probably what it is. I'm going to give it a C plus. Next up, we have Prison Realm, which for two generic and a white is an uncommon enchantment. And when it enters the battlefield, you exile target creature or planeswalker an opponent controls until it leaves the battlefield. And when it enters the battlefield, you scry one. So this is premium removal like all Oblivion Ring imitators are. It can hit the two most plentiful permanent types in this format, and it does have the downside all of these cards have. Your opponent can get the creature back or Planeswalker back if they blow up the enchantment, but that's not the end of the world. I mean, you're still going to be in pretty great shape. You know, it kind of sucks if they do it immediately, but if you manage to do this, and then like four turns later they manage to blow up your Prison Realm, you're probably still coming out ahead, just not as much. I also love that they just decided to tack Scry 1 onto this. I'm always a big fan of Scrying, making your draws better while also removing your opponent's best permanent from the game. Pretty nice deal. Overall, I think this is a good card. I think it's basically going to be first pickable in most packs you see that don't have some of the crazy bombs we've looked at so far, which means it's a B. Next up, we have Rally of Wings, which for one generic into white is an uncommon instant. It says untap all creatures you control. Creatures you control with flying get plus two, plus two, and no end of turn. This is an interesting card. Obviously, you need a ton of flyers for this to work out, but I think blue-white, as usual, is going to have a lot of those. You probably need at least seven flyers for this to be worth it, and more would probably be better, so I guess I should be giving this a build-around grade. I think it's probably an F in most decks in the format. Just in tapping your creatures for two mana is not going to be worth it most of the time. You need to be pumping your creatures too for this to really be doing the work you want it to. And by the way, one of the better things to do with this is to attack first, and then use Rally of Wings, so that way it's sort of like you have pseudo-vigilance going on. So keep that in mind. You can also use it as a combat trick if you do it that way, but, you know, if you're already attacking with flyers, maybe they can't block anyway. If you have enough flyers, this becomes very powerful. It's flexible in that you can use it to do lethal, and you can use it to get larger flyers out of your way and keep your creatures alive. You can also use it to untap all your flyers to eat your opponent's creatures, but I think that's sort of the, like, D-level use of the card. I think it's going to be a lot better if you're using it offensively. Uh, aggressive with this sort of effect is almost always best. But I think this needs a build-around grade. Like I said, I think it's an F in your average white deck, but probably a C-plus in a deck that gets enough flyers. 
Next up, we have Ravnica at War, which for three generic into white is rare, and it says, and it's a sorcery, and it says, exile all multicolored permanents. So I think there are enough gold cards in this set that Ravnica at War is going to be useful. There aren't as many as in a normal Ravnica set, but there are still more than we usually see. Thing is, you're going to be playing them too, so I do think you need to be a little careful about how you use this, but if you can use it to kill one or two of your opponent's multicolored permanents and one or none of yours, I think it's okay. It requires the board to look a certain way, so I certainly wouldn't take it early, but I do think I would feel fine about having one of these in my deck, though I would be ready to side it out if I play game one against an opponent and see very few things that it can kill. I'm giving it a C. Next up, we have Rising Populous, which for two generic and a white is a 2-2 human at common. And whenever another creature or planeswalker you control dies, it gets a plus one, plus one counter. This sort of creature always seems to disappoint, though it does look like maybe Black White is going to have some aristocrat things going on, in which case maybe it's better than I think. Three mana, two, two is not a stat line you want to have, but it does get better the longer the game goes on. It gets bigger the longer the game goes on. It seems all right, but might be better with more sacrifice outlets and it is helped some by proliferate but i don't think it is going to be a premier card for any white decks in this format it's just a c and i could honestly see it slipping a little bit lower because these cards always seem to underperform next up we have single combat which for three generic and two white is a rare sorcery and it says each player chooses a creature or planeswalker they control then sacrifices the rest players can't cast creatures or planeswalker spells until the end of your next turn Board sweepers that let your opponent make decisions can be frustrating. I mean, this is still a board sweeper, but the fact your opponent will always hold on to their best creature is annoying because it means that if you cast this and your opponent already has the best creature on the table, you're not going to be able to do anything about it. Sure, it wipes out the rest of your opponent's team and sometimes that's all you need. And yeah, it makes it so that neither player can play creatures on their next turn, which is kind of cool flavor wise, but Still, the fact that this is a situational board sweeper keeps it from being a straight up bomb for me. I think it's still good, don't get me wrong, but it's a B plus, not an A. Next up we have Sunblade Angel, which for five generic and a white is an uncommon angel. And it's a three three and it has flying, first strike, vigilance, and lifelink. I remember back in the day, a Chroma Angel of Wrath was crazy powerful and cost a lot more mana. Obviously, being hyperbolic, this isn't quite a Chroma, but it is a mini a Chroma, packed full of keyword abilities that all work well together. Flying in first strike make it hard to block, meaning it will get in for damage frequently and gain you life with lifelink, which makes it incredibly difficult for your opponent to race you. Meanwhile, Vigilance makes sure that she can hang back and block too, and as a three power creature, she will be pretty good at that. The one thing she doesn't have going for her is her low toughness, meaning lots of cheap removal spells in this format can take her down and trade up for her. There are things that cost two or three mana in this set that can easily kill her. Short of that, though, this can take over a game if, if it's left alive. I might be a little too high on it right now, but I see this as a good finisher for any white deck. I also think it's potentially splashable. I'm going to start it at C+. It's a quality six mana creature to be sure, but I don't think you really want to be starting your draft this way. Next up, we have Teo, the Shield Mage, which for two generic and a white is a legendary Planeswalker Teo at Uncommon. So it's our first Uncommon Planeswalker to show up in one of these. There are 19 more of them in the set review. Uh, he starts with five loyalty, and his static ability is you have Hexproof. His one loyalty ability, all the Uncommon Walkers only have one loyalty ability, and it's a minus ability. In this case, it's minus two. Create a 0-3 white wall creature token with Defender. This isn't the best of these new uncommon planeswalkers to look at because I don't think this one's particularly good. Basically, you're paying three for a 0-3 wall and maybe you get a second one too. Neither situation is one I'm excited about. With most of these walkers, if you get to use their ability the second time, they turn out pretty good. In this case, not so much. I'm not going to be happy about it. I'm not going to be excited about it in any way. And in fact, I'd probably wish I just had like a three mana 3-3 three, three, then Teo. I think in conjunction with some other walkers you want to protect, it could be something because obviously he can help you do that. But in addition to all of that, his static ability isn't going to come up very often. Um, it might against some opponents. You know, there are discard effects, burn effects in this format, but there's not enough of them that that's really going to matter a lot of the time. Mostly, I think that T.O. is just a D. You'll play him if you're desperate. Otherwise, you're not going to. And I think that's what you hope is going to happen, that you're not going to play him. 
Next up, we have Tio's Light Shield. Every Planeswalker in this set also has at least one card that is sort of associated with them. Most of them have their own name in them, and this is Tio's, who we just saw. For two generic and a white, this is a 0-3 illusion at common, and when it enters the battlefield, you put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. I actually like this more than I like Tio. A 3-mana 1-4 is an okay deal, and a 3-mana 0-3 that can put a counter on something a little more meaningful, like with flying, is even better. I think this is solid filler for white decks, especially the ones interested in taking advantage of plus-1-plus-1 one plus one counters and proliferate, and I think that makes this a C. Next up, we have Tomic, Distinguished Advocist, who for 2 white mana is a 2-3 Legendary Human Advisor at rare. It's got flying, and it says lands on the battlefield and land cards in graveyards can't be the target of spells or abilities your opponents control. Your opponent can't play land cards from graveyards. So this is obviously a hate bear with constructed decks like Dredge and its sights. But it isn't anything special and limited. I mean, a 2-mana two 2-3 two, flyer is good and all, don't get me wrong. And if this were one generic and a white for a 2-3 flyer, well, we'd be in business. But the mana cost here holds it back. And your chances of actually playing it on turn 2 and limited are going to be pretty, well, limited. I'm not saying it's a bad card or anything. The efficiency is good. It just isn't something remotely first pickable. And I think it ends up being just sort of filler just because it's not all that easy to cast, which means it's a C. Next up is Topple the Statue, which for two generic and a white is a common instant, and it says tap target permanent. If it's an artifact, destroy it, draw a card. So when we see three mana tap a permanent draw a card effects, they usually aren't all that great. They aren't terrible either, since they replace themselves. The fact this is an instant is nice too, because you can use it to stop your opponent from attacking with, let's say, a flying creature, and then that same creature won't be able to block the next turn. Frequently when this effect is only sorcery speed, all you're doing is stopping one block. And granted, a lot of the times that's still all you're going to be doing with it, but it does have that additional upside of maybe stopping an attack and a block. There is the whole artifact upside on it here, but this format has like six or seven artifacts in it, and most of them aren't even that good, so that part basically doesn't matter on this card. It'll come up on very, very rare occasions, let's say. All in all, I don't think this is that good. Um, if there were more artifacts in the set, obviously it would go up, but there just aren't. I think it's just a D+. I think you only play it if you're desperate for a card. You know, and it's kind of, sort of, if you need something in an aggro deck, then you don't have enough, like, removal to actually get a blocker out of the way in your deck. This is the kind of thing that can sort of help you get there, but I think you hope it's not what you end up needing to use. Next up, we have Trusted Pegasus, which for two generic and a white is a 2-2 common Pegasus with flying. And when it attacks, target attacking creature without flying gains flying until end of turn. Seems like every set lately has a blue or white flying creature who can give other attackers flying, and they're always pretty good. This one is a Windrake, and I'm pretty much sold on that. I think this is in the bottom range of first pickable, but it gets there because of its efficiency and the major threat it can present to your opponent, despite only costing three mana, and it can do it at all stages of the game because it can give anything flying. I'm giving this a B-. Next up, we have the Wanderer, which for three generic and a white is a legendary planeswalker who mysteriously has no planeswalker, you know, subtype. It's an uncommon. Its static ability says prevent all non-combat damage that would be dealt to you and other permanents you control. And it has five loyalty when it comes into play. And it has a minus two ability. Exile target creature with power four or greater. This is a much better walker to look at than Teo. Sure, the loyalty ability is somewhat situational, but I think most opponents are going to have a few targets for it, and if you can play this, kill something, and then maybe kill something else later in the game, that's a two-for-one, and that's the kind of thing that can win you the game. This static ability also looks like it'll come up a decent percentage of the time in this format. There are several burned-based removal spells, uh, both in black and red, and this negates cards that do that, more or less. But I do think most of its value comes from its minus two ability. I think this card is perfectly fine to play in your main 40, but I do want to give it a sideboard grade. And I guess it's sort of a grade to show that it has a massive amount of upside. But I think on average in your deck, it's probably only going to be like a C, which is a perfectly solid card, especially because there's Planeswalker synergies in this set. Uh, you can add counters to it, proliferate, which makes it even better. Uh, but I would say you need to be willing to cite it out if you play against someone where none of what is said on the Wanderer is relevant. I don't think that'll happen most of the time, and I think that's why the Wanderer is main boardable. But I think it can happen, and if it does, be willing to side her out. I do think, you know, sort of as a sideboard card, she's a B. So there'll be, be opponents you play against, especially the red-green deck, which is obsessed with power four or greater in this set. 
Uh, there'll be opponents you play against where she can just kill two things every time you play her. And when she can do that, it's, she's just going to be insane. But again, I would say, you know, I think it's, I don't think it's incorrect to start her in your sideboard or to play her in your deck. Just be ready either way to side her in or out because she's going to show up and be useful at some point during your matches in a draft, but she might not be always useful or as useful. Next up, we have the Wanderer's, you know, special card, which is Wanderer's Strike, which for four generic into white is a common sorcery. It says exile target creature, then proliferate. I think this is premium removal, despite its cost. Five mana is a lot, but these days, kind of what we expect to kill something, no questions asked, and that's what this does. Being a sorcery does make it a little clunky, but adding proliferate in a set that seems to have a plethora of reasons to proliferate, I think is what puts it firmly as a B minus, a card you can consider first picking. Next up, we have our final white card, which is also a bird, so you know I'm excited about that, and that is War Screecher, which for four generic into white is a 1-3 bird at common with flying, and you can pay five generic into white to tap it, and other creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. So two mana 1-3 flyers are usually something like a C-. minus. They're nothing special, but they block all right and can get in for a few evasive damage. This two mana 1-3 flyer remains relevant for longer than most, though, because by the late part of the game, it can pump your whole team. This can obviously be a powerful ability, even just to threaten when you are attacking. Obviously, this does get better the wider you can go, but I think that it will be fine in really any white deck. It isn't anything special, but I think it's solid filler, and you know, you need two drops, and as far as two drops go, this is a solid one. Probably not as good as the Pouncing Lynx, but I'll take it. I think it's a C. All right, well, that does it for every white card in War of the Spark. Tomorrow, I'll be back to talk about every blue card in this set. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch the rest of the set review and lots of other limited content, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.